Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar in the Asian Carp Canada series titled Asian Carp 101. My name is Christine Pinckney, and I'm the Asian Carp Project Coordinator at the Invasive Species Centre. The Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit, partner-based organization that was created to serve as a focal point for the coordination of activities around invasive species research, innovation, public awareness, and education. After the presentation, there will be a brief question and answer period. If you wish to ask a question, please type it into the question box during the webinar, and our presenter will try and answer as many as she can with the, re with the remaining time. So today I'd like to introduce you to Becky Cudmore, who is a leader in the field of aquatic invasive species research. Becky is a senior science advisor and manager of the Asian Carp Project for the Fisheries and Oceans Canada Center of Expertise for Aquatic Risk Assessment. And this is located in the New Burlington Science Laboratory at the Bayfield Institute. Becky provides scientific advice and information on aquatic invasive species to senior government officials within and outside of Fisheries and Oceans Canada and to other countries. She is also responsible for conducting risk assessments to identify and advise on levels of biological risk associated with potential or newly arrived invasive species. Today, Becky is going to talk about the four species of invasive Asian carp which threaten to invade the Great Lakes, and she's going to describe what actions are being taken to prevent it, this. So, Becky, I'm going to give it over to you. Hi. Well, welcome everyone. I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their busy schedules to join this talk. Um, as Christine said, my name is Becky Cudmore. I am the manager of Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian Carp Program, and the title of my presentation is Asian Carp 101. In this presentation, I have broken it down into three sections. The first section, I will speak about Asian carps. What are they? Where do they come from? How did they get here? I will also then talk about the threats they pose to the Great Lakes and finally finish with the uh, summary of DFO's Asian carp program. So first, Asian carps. Um, Asian carps is a, collect, is a term that is used for a group of actually four species. It isn't just one species. And these four species are grass carp, big head carp, silver carp, and black carp. Gorgeous fish, gorgeous large freshwater fish. To talk a little bit about each one in detail, the first one I'm going to talk about is grass carp. Grass carp does get to be uh, quite a large size, between 30 and 50 kilograms, and reaches up to a meter in length. Its diet uh, consists of aquatic plants, can consume up to 40% of its body weight. Um, I have a picture here of grass carp as well as a picture of, on the right side of your screen, a common carp. I've put that up there because these two species are very often confused by the public. Um, we're getting a lot of reports of, of potential grass carp sightings for which we really appreciate. Um, but we did want to highlight, there, it's really easy to tell the difference between the two. Uh, the first thing to look for is at the corner of the mouth. On a common carp, you will see a whisker-like appendage, known as a barbel. Uh, common carp have that little whisker, and grass carp do not. The other main difference between a grass carp and a common carp, a common carp has a very long dorsal fin, so the fin on the top of its body is quite long compared to a very short dorsal fin on a grass carp. The next species, silver carp. Silver carp reaches about 40 kilograms, sometimes more, uh, in weight and a meter in length. Its diet consists primarily of phytoplankton, which is the small uh, plant material in the water column. Very similar is the big head carp. It gets to be about the same size, around 40 kilograms, about a meter in length. Its diet consists primarily of zooplankton, which is the small animals in the water column. 
The fourth species, black carp, uh, is one of the largest of the four Asian carps. It reaches up to 60 kilograms and often exceeds one meter in length. Uh, its diet item is actually mussel species. And one of the more interesting things about Asian carp biology is their spawning requirements. Uh, they do have very exacting requirements um, for the development of eggs and larvae. Asian carp swim up a tributary, and um, those tributaries are generally thought to, to be, or, that are required, are large, unimpeded rivers with lengths of 100 kilometers. So um, Asian carp do, they swim up these tributaries, uh, they lay their eggs, the eggs then have to remain buoyant in the water column, uh, float back down for a certain length of time while the eggs develop, and the larvae hatch out at the mouth of the tributary where there's a wetland area. So a, dis a good discharge, a nice high flow is necessary, and those eggs require approximately 30 hours of incubation time. Now, having said that, that is the requirements that we're seeing in their native range. They have surprised us here in North America. We have seen them spawning in a less, uh, less than thought of river length, 25 kilometers, possibly even 15 kilometers is all that's now required for a successful spawning of Asian carp. We're finding them finding out that they're spawning in narrower rivers with less flow and discharge than previously thought. We're seeing a longer spawning season for these species. We're also seeing a shorter egg incubation time, four to six hours shorter. And that egg settling appears to be taking place at mean velocities much lower than previously thought. So looking at the biology of the Asian carp, um, you can ask the question, are Asian carps good invaders? Well, they do produce a lot of offspring. They grow very quickly, reaching the uh, significant size within the first year of life. Because they grow very quickly, they they do outgrow uh, any predators that could uh, consume them, so they do have few predators when they're older. They are adaptable, as we can see with their spawning habitats, uh, spawning uh, characteristics. They have been able to change uh, their spawning needs in order to meet a new environment, and therefore they are good survivors. So are Asian carps good invaders? Uh, the answer is yes, and in fact, we would give them a gold star. They're definitely very good invaders. So where did Asian carp come from? Uh, these are maps of their native range, and you can see that all four species overlap uh, somewhat in China and Russia. But how did they get here to North America? Well, they were brought here to, the, to North America, uh, to the United States, for use in aquaculture facilities. Each species of Asian carp provides a a valuable job in an aquaculture facility. Uh, grass carp do help maintain plant growth in aquaculture ponds and agricultural ponds. Big head and silver carp eat the, the consume the algae and uh, any uh, zooplankton material in the water column. And black carp are really good at consuming the snails that are often infesting catfish ponds. So it was never really intended for these species to be le released into the wild until uh, uh, several decades later when uh, specifically grass carp were stocked into the natural environment for use in controlling macrophytes in agricultural systems. So that direct stocking has led to populations in the natural environment for grass carp. Big head, silver, and black carp were released into the natural environment uh, due to flooding events that overflowed uh, aquaculture facilities. Big head and grass carp are also very valuable in the live food fish trade. Um, and it's through this mechanism that there have been introductions into the natural environment through the source population being a live food market. So taking into account the biology of the species, the fact that they were brought here to North America and subsequently released into the natural environment, what's the concern? So looking at uh, Asian carp movement from uh, locations in the southern United States. We've seen over the last 20 years a significant movement uh, northwards through the Mississippi River Basin towards the Great Lakes. 
And how close are they to the Great Lakes? So this is a map from um, colleagues in the United States that sh indicates where the Asian carp population front is, which is about 55 miles from Lake Michigan, which is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Now there's no spawning there. There's just uh, a few adult populations. The presence of verified spawning activity is 64 miles from Lake Michigan. And at the established population, the closest observed established population is 143 miles from Lake Michigan. I'm not going to talk too much more about uh, the work in the U.S., the status of the population in the U.S., because uh, the Asian Carp Canada webinar series has invited Kevin Irons from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources to speak a little bit more about this later on in the web series. So what kind of impacts have they been having in the Mississippi River Basin? There's been a loss of native fish diversity. There's been damage to commercial nets. There's a decline in the fisheries value, fishery value. Uh, Asian carp are low dollar value fish. And because of the loss of diversity, the commercial fish uh, that make up that uh, native diversity has declined. And of course, what they're most famous for, the silver carp, is their jumping behavior leading to injury and property damage. So Asian carp has been on the radar screen for both Canada and the U.S. for quite some time uh, in the Great Lakes area. And um, in 2004, DFO had conducted a risk assessment. And the risk assessment was really to answer a very broad question. Was there a risk to Canadian waters? Uh, we did find that that risk was high. Uh, you can see with the map, any area that was red in this map uh, indicates the ability for, in this case, silver carp to uh, survive in North America. And you can see there is uh, a significant amount of ecological characteristics that would allow it to survive in North America. In 2005, there was a black carp risk assessment done um, by uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. Again, it was very broad, looking at the risk to uh, the United States. And in 2007, silver and big head carp was assessed, again, very broadly, what was the risk to the United States. Um, in all cases, the risk was high. But looking back into 2010, um, th there was a lot more work underway with Asian carp in the Great Lakes Basin in the United States. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative had funded a lot of research to be done. We were learning a lot more about these species. We had a lot more information on their biology, their ecology, uh, what differences they were exhibiting in their new at adopted range versus their native range. We were also seeing that they were coming a little bit closer than expected with the advent of DNA showing up uh, closer than we had seen actual individuals of Asian carp. And this led to a lot of questions, with, uh, specifically for the Great Lakes. Would they be able to survive in the Great Lakes? The, yeah, would the habit, was there enough habitat for them? Would there be enough food? And this, all these questions made it very difficult for managers and decision makers around the Great Lakes to decide um, what kind of actions needed to be taken with respect to Asian carp. So it was decided that a risk assessment needed to be conducted specifically for the Great Lakes, taking into account all the new information and research that was out there, and that that risk assessment would be done on a binational basis. So Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Center of Expertise for Aquatic Risk Assessment uh, led the risk assessment. It was coordinated by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and we had authors, authors participate from the U.S. Geological Survey. In talking to the Great Lakes managers, we asked them, what are your top two priority species that you would like us to conduct a risk assessment for? Uh, and they requested uh, big head and silver carp. So uh, risk assessment was underway. How we conducted the risk assessment was following a, a very typical process where we looked at the probability of introduction. And in that, we look at the likelihood for big head and silver carp, in this case, to arrive in the Great Lakes, to survive, to establish, and to spread. 
and then we would look at what the magnitude of the ecological consequences would be should they be able to arrive, survive, establish, and spread in the Great Lakes. We take those two components and we come up with an overall risk. Now, risk assessment just doesn't answer the one question, what is the risk? It does provide scientifically defensible advice for use in determining prevention actions. For example, looking at likelihood of arrival, we do need to identify all potential entry routes. It does provide advice for monitoring, where best to monitor for these species. Um, what areas do we need to focus on in terms of outreach to the public and to what stakeholders do we need to get in touch with. It identifies knowledge gaps where more research is required as well as uh, identification of advice for management and control activities. So in 2011, this risk assessment was completed and released, and I'm going to walk through the key results of the risk assessment. Uh, there's a lot more information in those risk assessments available, um, and that's available on uh, DF DFO's Center of Expertise for Aquatic Risk Assessments website. So I'm going to walk through each step in the risk assessment process and highlight some of the key results. So in terms of the key results from the likelihood of arrival, the risk assessment found that the most likely entry point to the Great Lakes would be through the physical connection of the Chicago area waterway system because of an already invaded water body as well as that direct connection to Lake Michigan. Uh, the risk assessment did acknowledge that there were other physical connections that existed between the invaded water body of the Mississippi River Basin and the Great Lakes Basin, but those connections were a lower risk. Trade, it was also identified as another potential entry route into the Great Lakes Basin, um, but that more research was needed in order to fully assess the level of risk that entry route posed. In terms of survival, um, we did find that there would enough food, there was enough habitat in all five of the Great Lakes, especially Lake Erie, for these fishes to survive as well as over winter. We also found that they would consume bottle, bottom debris and even pseudofeces from zebra mussels in order to survive if they were in areas where there was a lack of food. Um, we also determined that they actually would not compete with zebra mussels even though they were also filter feeder fish. In terms of key results with respect to the likelihood of establishment, um, we did find that there were suitable spawning conditions uh, around the Great Lakes, especially in Canada where we had up to 57 rivers that had suitable spawning conditions for the big head and silver carp. There was extensive wetlands available uh, with within the basin for the nursery habitat of big head and silver carps. And we did find through computer modeling that it would only require as few as 10 females and a similar number of males to have a greater than 50% chance of annual successful spawning. Therefore, the likelihood of establishment was about 100%. Following the introduction into a single lake uh, using computer modeling, we found that these species would be expected to spread to the other lakes within 20 years. The spread would be more rapid for uh, the central lakes, Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Erie. Uh, there would be spread potentially to Lake Superior, uh, and it would take longer for the fish to reach Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, um, primarily because Lake Erie provides such uh, perfect habitat for them uh, has enough food availability that the fish would be reluctant to leave Lake Erie and move and be forced to move into Lake Ontario. In terms of the ecological consequences, uh, we predicted that planktivores would be forced to compete for their primary food source. As big-headed carps possess the special adaptations in their gill structures, they are very effective at uh, consuming phytoplankton and zooplankton and they have a voracious appetite. They eat a 20 to and greater percent of their body weight a day. So this would significantly reduce the number of the native planktivores in the Great Lakes region and would impact the food web. In turn, the reduction of those native planktivores would reduce the number of piscivores uh, in the Great Lakes, and those species that would be impacted would be, the yellow, would be species like yellow perch and walleye. 
So taking into account the information on the, like, on the uh, probability of introduction and the consequences in terms of the ecological impacts, the overall risk was uh, found to be high, especially in the central lakes, so Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Erie, and that we found that if nothing further was done, those impacts would continue to increase over time. We did find in the risk assessment uh, that the impact of the Big Head and Silver Carps on the Great Lakes is directly related to establishment. So it is really critical, that's a critical control point in the invasion process that uh, we need to focus on. We need to prevent establishment in the Great Lakes. In Canada, um, where we don't have uh, a major invasion underway, uh, at this time, uh, it makes more sense for us to focus on preventing establishment by preventing introduction. So based on that advice, uh, DFO uh, initiated a Asian CARP program. That program began in 2012 and is funded for five years. And the goal of the Asian CARP program is to protect the integrity of the Great Lakes Basin by preventing the introduction, uh, which includes preventing their arrival, their establishment, and their spread of all four species of Asian carbs. And we will work with partners in order to get that work done. Uh, the program is built on uh, four what we call program pillars. The first being prevention, where outreach, research, and risk assessment activities is undertaken. The second pillar is early warning. The third is response. Uh, providing advice, analyses, as well as action. And the fourth pillar is management. And in this case, we're not talking about management of a population. Uh, the goal of the program at this time is prevention. And so we're talking um, management of pathways and development of regulations. So to walk through a little bit uh, on, the, on DFO's Asian CARP program, I'm going to first look at the first pillar, prevention. In terms of outreach, uh, we are really lucky in Ontario to have great partners to work with on uh, engaging Canadians and providing public outreach. We're working with Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters on a public outreach campaign focused on Asian carp. So hopefully you've seen billboards up there, uh, print ads, uh, they will be organizing public meetings and developing public service announcements. We are also working, obviously, with the Invasive Species Center uh, to increase awareness and provide a, um, greater availability of Asian carp information to the public and other agencies. And they're doing that by hosting the Asian Carp Canada website, uh, increasing a digital footprint for the awareness of Asian carp, and obviously for uh, developing and hosting webinar series. And we're working on developing more relationships with other groups um, for the next couple of years to uh, make sure that Canadians are aware of the threat that Asian carp pose and what they can do about it. In terms of research, we have a lot of research underway. Um, while the program focuses on prevention, uh, we do feel it would be unwise to wait until there was a problem in order to begin research on how to control an Asian carp population in Canada. We do feel it's important to be proactive, and so we're beginning research now, and while our goal is on prevention, we also uh, recognize that we need to be prepared. So we have some research underway where we're looking at uh, how fish react to different control uh, and barrier mechanisms. So we have tagged common carp as our surrogate for Asian carp, and we have them in a large mesocosm here in Burlington, where, and we're looking at how those fish react to acoustic barriers, carbon dioxide barriers, um, electric barriers, pressure barriers, and bubble barriers. We are also looking at how fish move through canals. Uh, we think this is an important entry point for us in Canada, and understanding how fish move through canals can provide useful information for perhaps an early warning system as well as a potential control system. So that work is underway uh, in the Welland Canal and also I should mention in the St. Mary's River as well. 
If you remember from earlier in the presentation, I talked about that we had identified uh, several tributaries that provided suitable spawning habitat for Asian carp. Um, that information has been really useful in determining uh, where we need to look for Asian carp. But we do recognize that with further information, more research being done on these species, we can continually refine uh, these tributary analysis so that work is being done and underway. And we're also getting started on some grass carp research to better understand and provide information um, to feed into a risk assessment. I just really briefly talked about the research that's being done with the Asian carp program because um, I didn't want to steal the thunder from Dr. Nick Mandrak, who has been invited to I'll give a webinar specifically on the Canadian research that's being done in support of, the Asi of Asian carp management. So he will be going into this and a lot more um, in, in greater detail on December 2nd. So under that prevention pillar, we also have risk assessment activities. Um, risk assessment is a, an important tool in a preventative aquatic invasive species program. It provides science advice for management in terms of prevention as well as control. So we've done the 2011 risk assessment on big head and silver carp. Activities that we have currently underway is finalizing for release a social economic risk assessment for big head and silver carp. And we also have two other species to look at, grass and black carps. Um, a, bi a binational risk assessment for the Great Lakes is planned for both those species. The grass carp risk assessment has begun, and a black carp risk assessment will begin in December. So just to talk a little bit more about the grass carp risk assessment, why do we need one? Well, uh, grass carp, as we know, consume a large amount of vegetation, and this has implications to change the plant, the invertebrate, and the fish communities, as well as water quality in the Great Lakes. The fact that there's a, a current proximity to and occurrences in the Great Lakes Basin indicates a significant threat to the Great Lakes fisheries. We, there is evidence from our colleagues with the U.S. Geological Survey of reproduction in the uh, American waters of Lake Erie. So we're at a point where Great Lakes managers are asking for scientifically defensible advice to help focus prevention efforts um, on all on the focus, first of all, to identify all entry points to the Great Lakes, and then to help focus at those prevention efforts on the highest risk entry points. They're looking for advice on the identification of con con key control points in the invasion process, the identification of vulnerable areas for early detection and surveillance for grass carp, as well as advice to inform rapid response activities. And another key question for the risk assessment will be, what is the uh, relative risk of grass carp compared to the big head and silver carp? Where does it fit in in terms of um, risk level? Moving on to the second pillar of the program, early warning. Uh, we have a, a, a very strong and large component of um, monitoring with uh, using traditional gear. We have established early detection sites in the Great Lakes at areas of the highest risk for arrival in the establishment. That information came from uh, the 2011 risk assessment. We are establishing monitoring program protocols for Great Lakes habitats. And we're also conducting um, fish community surveys while we're out there in order to get an idea of what the baseline fish community is like right now before an invasion occurs. Hopefully that does not occur, uh, but if it did, then we would have information to compare before and after invasion uh, with respect to the fish communities. So we're in our second, just finishing up our second season of early warning and monitoring, where we use traditional gears and do very targeted surveys. We use boat electrofishing as well as a variety of nets. So far to date, we've established 35 sites in all the Great Lakes. And we're, as I said, we're just wrapping up the season where uh, this fall we've been revisiting the high priority sites in Lakes Huron and Erie for a second, sometimes third time of the season. And we're completing scouting sites in Lake Superior. 
Again, I'm not going to get into too much detail on the results of our monitoring program because on November 25th, uh, biologists with the Asian CARP program will be talking about Canadian monitoring strategies and activities. Uh, environmental DNA, looking for genetic material of Asian carps in the water, is one tool in our surveillance toolbox um, that we could use. Right now, it is a new tool. It's still under development, and, um, and we're still working on research and what results mean. Right now, a positive detection in the environment doesn't necessarily tell us whether that DNA is from a live fish, a dead fish, or whether it was transferred through alternate methods, such as through bird feces um, attached to boat hulls, or just movement of water, which we do know occurs. But it's a very promising tool and one that we're happily investing in um, with the hope of operationalizing that tool soon in the future. We do have the ability to collect water samples here in Burlington, Ontario, and we send those sam the, the filters, the water filters, to um, our genetics lab in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where the analysis are done. A little bit more on environmental DNA, the tool it's used, in a lot, and uh, some new innovations being developed by the province of Ontario will be talked about in November by Dr. Chris Wilson. Moving on to the third pillar of the program, response. Uh, response is a very important next step in terms of the Asian CARP program. While we're out, conducting early detection surveillance, the idea is to find a species early, an Asian carp early, before it has a chance to get a hold in the system and become established. If we detect a species, um, we do have to have a response action. Uh, and an interesting thing about Asian carp, specifically grass carp, is that grass carp, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, have been stocked in the wild. Most of those stocked fish have been altered so that they're sterile, uh, also known as triploid. And that they were done that to minimize uh, any potential impacts and to eliminate the ability of those species to reproduce and spread. So when we find, however, um, not all fish uh, that are found in North America, not all grass carp that are found in the wild in North America are triploid or sterile, and as I mentioned earlier as well, um, we do have evidence of reproduction in the American waters of Lake Erie. So when we find here in Canada a grass carp, it is really important for us to determine whether or not that fish is sterile or fertile, and um, because that really does inform what direction we take our response actions. Um, if we are looking, if we find a fertile fish, a diploid, um, it changes the game for us. We need to then start looking for uh, definitely other individuals, but also young. So it is really important that that information is provided uh, as quickly as possible. So we are able to conduct uh, with the DFO's Asian Carp Program analysis, as well as other biological sampling, such as age, of any Asian Carp specimens that we find. A part of the response is also uh, coordination. We need to coordinate domestically with the province of Ontario, as well as internationally with um, the United States. Uh, this bottom picture uh, on the slide you're seeing now is from a Asian carp exercise that uh, the states of Ohio and Michigan put on, and uh, there were several Canadians there uh, happily coordinating, have a happy, happily participating in this coordination effort. In terms of uh, response actions, we are also engaged in training. Um, what kind of gear do we need to use in response actions? Um, what kind of protocols are we going to develop and implement? And of course, the most important part of response is the actual activity of responding. And we have had uh, that occur in, the, in Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. We have captured three grass carp. Uh, all in the Grand River near Dunville, Ontario. Uh, one grass carp was actually angled um, 
by a member of the public, and two were captured during DFO's early detection surveillance program uh, in a trammel net. In uh, all three cases, DFO worked with the province of Ontario, and uh, we responded quickly with DFO crews out on the water and looking for any further individuals. And of course, I'm happy to report that all three grass carp that were captured were found to be triploid or sterile. Moving on to the fourth pillar of DFO's Asian carp program management, uh, we have provided identification training and supplies for enforcement officers to inspect shipments of live fish. Um, as I mentioned previously, big head and grass carp are, uh, are, form a part of the live food trade. And uh, while it is illegal to possess and sell any Asian carp species in the province of Ontario, um, we do of course know that illegal activities occur. We are also have the capability and have conducted analyses of sea specimens from trade. Uh, it's an important in piece of information for us to know whether um, Asian carp that are coming across the border are from aquaculture facilities or they're wild caught. So we conduct those analyses and also confirm for the courts um, the identification of the species. As I mentioned, Asian carp are prohibited for sale and possession in the province of Ontario under provincial regulations. At this time, it is not illegal to import them uh, into Canada. And recognizing that gap, Fisheries and Oceans Canada it has developed national aquatic invasive species regulations in order to prevent import, transport, and spread of high-risk aquatic invasive species such as Asian carps. All our science activities with the Asian Carp Program is conducted out of DFO's new Asian Carp Laboratory here in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, we conduct our research activities, our monitoring activities, and response activities uh, from this site. So in summary, Asian Carps, all four species, are excellent invaders. They do pose a real and significant threat to the Great Lakes fisheries, the native fishes, and our economy. And we do really feel it's important to get the message out of the threat these species pose in order to prevent uh, their establishment in the Great Lakes. And through DFO's new Asian Carp program, um, we're working to do this with our Great Lakes with Great Lakes agencies, academic institutions, and non-governmental organizations. And our program is, is proactive and prevention-based. The reason why it's prevention-based, because we love our Great Lakes. Um, this is a very typical uh, Canadian scene of our shore, um, and we really want to keep it looking like this and not have these species here. So with that, I'd like to thank the Invasive Species Centre for coordinating and hosting these webinar series, and also my staff with the Asian Carp Program, especially Erin Gertson, uh, who was a, a big help in getting this webinar up and running. So thanks very much. Thank you, Becky. That was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and uh, we're going to open it up to some questions. Now, I've asked everyone to please uh, put your questions into the question box um, in the webinar itself. And I have a few that have already been asked, so if that's okay with you, Becky, I'll go ahead and uh, go through a couple questions, and you can answer them, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Okay, so okay. the first question, great. great. Okay, the first question I have is from Matt. And he wants to know, how big of a problem do we have with individuals trying to move Asian carp across the bridge from Detroit to Windsor, headed for markets in Toronto? Um, well, I did indicate uh, with our 2011 risk assessment that trade is a potential entry route. Uh, but that more research was needed. Uh, we do know that that illegal activity exists, and thanks to the efforts of conservation officers with the province of Ontario and the um, Canada Board of Services agencies, shipments have been stopped. Um, but we don't know what we weren't able to stop. 
I do think it is a significant threat for Asian carp as well as other uh, potentially aquatic invasive species, and it's something that we plan to continue to look into. Okay, that's great. And the next question uh, we have from Christine, and her question is, um, given that, oh sorry, this one's from Kenneth, given that uh, we've not been that successful with the control of other invasive species such as zebra mussels, Asian milfoil, and lamprey, what is the likelihood that we'll be able to stop these fish from coming in? Oh, that's a really great question. And I am, what I would say is um, we've had some success with controlling, for example, sea lamprey. Um, we're able to minimize those, the populations in order to mitigate impacts on the fisheries. What we haven't been successful at is eliminating them from the system. And that is our lesson learned from history. Um, we found out about zebra mussels, milfoil, uh, sea lamprey when the species was already well established. So we had very little opportunity to do something about them uh, other than minimize their impacts. With respect to Asian carp, we're in a different stage in the invasion process. We're not here yet. So we can be proactive and prevent the arrival in the first place. And with the early detection program, uh, we're out really actively searching for them so that we find them before they get that hold in the system. So I think lessons learned. Uh, we can't wait for a species to arrive and react to it because we have limited opportunity to do much with it. This time around, we see them coming, we're being proactive, and we're getting ahead of the game. Excellent. Okay, now we have a question from Christine, and she's wanting to know why was it determined that Asian carps would not compete with zebra mussels in Lake Erie? Well, that's a good question, and you're going to test my memory. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, zebra mussel and Asian carp would occupy different areas of the lake habitat so that they wouldn't overlap in terms of the spatial requirements for their food. Um, I, I have my email up on the screen. Email me and I will dig out yeah, a little bit more details of, that, of the answer to that. But that is going to be the very, very basic answer for now. Um, and also if you wanted to go to the Center of Expertise for Aquatic Risk Assessment, uh, DFO's uh, website, uh, you will find the risk assessment there, and there's def definitely more detail in there as well. Okay, great. Um, I also have a question from Andrew, and Andrew is asking uh, what you think about the Michigan DNR finding um, environmental DNA traces of Asian carp in the Kalamazoo River this week. Right, so um, DNA, as I said, is a new tool. I think that the, the finding of those results raises a red flag for all of us around the Great Lakes. But as I said, we don't know what that DNA is from. We don't know if it's from live fish, dead fish, from um, boats that were in Asian carp infested waters and moved uh, out into the lake, or uh, the uh, Agencies in the United States have also determined that DNA survives through bird guts, so it can be found in feces as well. So um, I would say that raises the red flag. It reminds us to continue to be vigilant, but at this time we don't really know uh, what those results mean. Okay. And I have another question from Lisa. She's wondering, have there been any collaborations with conservation authorities in regards to monitoring programs for the identified suitable streams or nursery habitats for Asian carp? Well, when we go out to, so every week we're out somewhere different uh, from May, June into the end of October, uh, we let uh, it, conservation agencies as well as the province of Ontario know where we're going to be. Um, there has been interest uh, expressed by conservation authorities to to come out, join us, see the 
see the activities underway, the gears that we're using, which are fairly new, um, and so in some cases, the first time used in Canada. And so we absolutely uh, welcome uh, conservation authorities to come out, learn more about what we're doing, and to discuss uh, opportunities to work together. Excellent. Um, one more question. Um, the Asian CARP program if, with DFO uh, is for five years. Now, what happens after that five years is up and we hit 2017? What, what's going to happen about the Asian CARP project then? Well, it's hard, hard to predict what will happen. I think what we can do right now is focus on conducting the activities that we're obligated to conduct, uh, that we want to conduct, show some success, and perhaps uh, make a case to not only expand uh, and continue the Asian CARP program, but to think about incorporating other aquatic invasive species uh, into a, a longer term, broader program, uh, also focused on prevention. Excellent. Um, also, how is Canada working with the U.S. on protecting the Great Lakes from the Asian carps? Okay, that's, a, that's actually another great question. Um, the Great Lakes is an international body of water. Uh, we, we all recognize that we have to work together in order to protect that international body of water. So uh, we work very closely with the United States. Um, they are also in a different position than Canada is. They are dealing with an invasion that is on their doorstep. So while it's in our backyard, they're dealing, it, dealing with it on their doorstep. So we, uh, we work closely with the United States because there's a lot of research being done directly on these species. There's a lot of knowledge being gained that we can apply here in Canada. As well as uh, we're making sure that Asian carp don't enter from our side of the border as well. Um, so one of the key activities that uh, we have available to us is to be part of a large binational coordination group. And this group is the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. It has the support of Government of Canada, the White House, um, and all the state agencies, state and provincial agencies. And that group oversees and coordinates all the activities around the Great Lakes Basin to make sure that we're all aware of the work that's being done um, on both sides of the border. So they're a very significant and close partner, both federally as well as at the state level. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, Eugene is asking uh, that silver and big head carps are some of the few animals in the world that can ingest and incorporate cyanobacteria. And he wants to know, can you offer your thoughts on the implications regarding the recent state of the phytoplankton, phytoplankton assemblage on Western Lake Erie and tie that to the importance of nutrient management. Well, the interesting thing about big headed and silver carp and their ability to ingest cyanobacteria, uh, which at first glance you think, great, that solves the problem. Um, but what scientists in the United States are starting to discover is that the cyanobacteria passes not only unharmed, from the gut of the big-headed carbs, um, but that disturbance in the, um, co the consuming the cyanobacteria actually causes it to proliferate more. So while at first glance you think we've got a control mechanism for cyanobacteria, in reality what we would expect to see is the introduction and establishment of big-headed and silver carb in Lake Erie would actually cause uh, a greater problem in the future. Okay. Well, that's great, and that's all the time we have for questions. Um, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you to Becky for her, this wonderful and informative presentation about Asian carps. I also encourage everyone to please visit our new website at asiancarp.ca, which should be up and running um, next week at the, at the latest, and we are also going to have a recording on that site of this webinar if you'd like to uh, revisit any of the things that Becky's talked about. We'll also uh, have announcements on the site about the four other webinars that Becky talked about that are going to be coming up in the future. And that's going to be on environmental DNA, uh, Canadian monitoring strategies, activities and research in support of the Asian carp management, and the work in the United States on the, their Asian carp management and the Chicago area electrical barrier. 
And uh, so I hope you all enjoyed the webinar and I hope to see